So what we have here on, 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 on my left, your right, oh, sorry, too early. So this is um, Vidal, um, Paul Vidal de la Blanche, and he um, is a very eminent French geographer. And in 1911, uh, in a study of, of um, societies, he developed this concept um, called genre de vie, um, which he developed when he was analysing cultural landscapes. And he, he developed an agenda for, for geography and that agenda was that geography should try and capture the personality or, or um, the individuality of particular regions. And that concept that he developed that, that captured that individuality, that personality, was this notion of the genre de vie, which literally means lifestyle or style of living or mode of life, if you like. So he argued that every region has a distinct genre de vie. It has its own certain economic, social, spiritual and psychological identity. And that identity is imprinted in the landscape. So he developed this notion that a society's genre de vie is the geographical, ex geographical expression of its way of life, of its economy, or even its mode of production, if you wanted to use that level of abstraction. So when we um, are talking about a particular uh, type of geography that follows this man's approach, it's regarded as a Vidalian um, perspective, a, a Vidalian approach. So we jump from Paul Vidal de la Blanche to, um, from France to the United States. And this, is, this man is Carl Sauer, and he was the founder of the notion of cultural geography within the discipline of geography. And in 1930, he addressed the question of how should histor historical geography research the contact between cultures? And he argued that any study by geographers of dispossession would need to reconstruct the occupied area at the time of occupation so that there's a necessary datum line by which you can then measure the transformation induced by that dispossession. So when I was doing my PhD, I was concerned to document the dispossession of the Jaburung so these two geographers were influential in, in my, my doctoral research. And then we, we um, go to a contemporary of Carl Sauer from the Berkeley or Berkeley School of Geography at California, um, Derwent Whittlesey. So he, he suggested that when, when you're trying to understand the layering of colonial names over indigenous names, you ought to be able to do that through a lens that he called sequent occupants. And he, he developed this notion in 1929. So this is his way of describing and interpreting uh, succession in cultural landscapes. So he argued that any analysis of cultural landscape in a given area should reveal the features such as place names that have survived uh, from earlier occupancies. Place names being an example of that. So this means that when you're doing place names research, uh, when you're researching a particular area that's experienced colonisation, such as Australia, where you've had a succession of culture you would expect to see a mixture of place names from those cultures. So from an onomastic perspective, an onomastics is the study of names. So surnames, proper names, street names, road names, place names are all part of, 
of what's called onomastics. Some European universities have onomastics departments. It would be magnificent to be able to be a, a full-time professional onomastician. But unfortunately in, in Australia, um, place names tends to be researched by possibly in the English department or maybe in, in the geography department if that's surviving, there's even few of those anymore. So from a place names or onomastic perspective, the cultural landscape or the namescape is, is what we would call a palimpsest. Now I know that, that just means something that's still bearing the traces of its earlier form. So when you're looking at the Ballarat district, the Ballarat district's namescape is a palimpsest because you still experience, you still see place names from the earlier occupation by the Wadawurrung uh, along with uh, imposed names by European colonisers. So the, the Ballarat region's place namescape is a palimpsest. So in a colonial situation such as Australia's, where there's been settler colonialism and a succession of occupation, a mixture of toponyms should reflect the sequence of occupation. So we have a layer of indigenous names, some of which have been erased by Europeans and other non-indigenous names as well. So not all the place names that are raised indigenous names were European names, We'll get to one in a moment, but Dimbula is a Sri Lankan place name. Not, not it sound, people think it's indigenous, but it's actually from, from Sri Lanka. So um, place names are windows into the past. They reveal much about the societies that were responsible for layering place names. So Victoria's Britishness is reflected in its place names. But some international visitors to Victoria expressed an interest in and a preference for Indigenous place names. Take the case of uh, Isabella Bird, uh, the famous English geographer and travel writer who was a relative of William Wilberforce, the noted campaigner against slavery and promoter of Indigenous rights. Uh, Isabella Bird visited Victoria in 1872 and was underwhelmed by the many conferred Anglo and Scottish place names that she encountered. So I'll read this quote for you from, from her writing. A stage journey took me from the green reaches of Mortlake through a very beautiful and prosperous district rich in native names such as Kilambit, Nurat, Colac, Terang, Karangamite, into Grenville County. The rebaptizing of most of the country with the home names drowns it in prose. Many of the Aboriginal names are musical, all have a meaning, though in a few cases it has been lost, and they constitute a guide to the present and traditional peculiarities of the country. Who would not prefer Karakara, Wangaratta, Turak, Wimmera, Daninong, Dunbula? She actually is referring to Dimbula, but as I said earlier, Dimbula is a Sri Lankan place name. Bandura, Karoit, Murabu, Kolak, Yarra Yarra, Kilambit, Parambit, Terang, Geelong, Karangamite, Mitamita, Moriak, Koala, and a host of similar terminations. To repetitions more or less endless and always meaningless of English and Scotch names varied by such products of early pioneer colonisation and digger rushes as Fainting Range, Big Hill, Despair, Prospect, Broken Creek, Muddy Creek, Bulldog, Duck Ponds, Happy Valley, Long Gully, Miner's Rest, Peter's Diggings, Weatherboard, Scotchman's Lead, Fiddler's Creek, 
Lilliput and the like. <laughs> In fact, Isabella Bird was so disappointed with Victoria, um, with Australia, that she vowed and declared never in, in the rest of her travels to go to a British colony because she wanted to experience difference. She wanted to experience uh, non-British culture. Some of our earliest colonisers also expressed a preference for Indigenous place names. Um, this is Catherine Kirkland, who was at Trawalla Station with her husband in the early 1840s. And she's written in some of her writings. We were now in the Bonignong district, which takes its name from a very high mountain, on the top of which is a large hole filled with water. It is quite round, as if made by man, and there are fish and mussels in it. Bonignong is a native name and means big mountain. Now, we'll talk about this a bit later. Um, it's not quite correct there. I like the native names very much. I think it is a great pity to change them for English ones, as is often done. So, there's a, an existential tension between residence gaze and what is understood as the tourist gaze. And that's a critical dichotomy between settler attachment to place names and visitor expectations that Indigenous place names would predominate in the cultural landscape or namescape. So Isabella Bird expected that when she came to Victoria that Indigenous place names would, would dominate. So her, her tourist gaze was quite different to a settler gaze uh, which expected... Um, there would be probably more European names. Um, Ari explains part of the tourist experience is to gaze upon or view a set of different landscapes which are out of the ordinary. When we go away, we look at the environment with interest and curiosity. It speaks to us in ways we appreciate or at least anticipate that it will do so. Ari confirms that central to the notion of departure, of a limited breaking with established routines and practices of everyday life, is this notion of difference, the engagement with a set of stimuli that contrasts with the everyday and the mund mundane. So understanding Isabella Bird then, travelling from Britain to Victoria, she anticipated that she would experience a fundamental difference, an Australian cultural landscape, divergent from the familiar England and Scotland, and yet she was affronted by her encounters with transplanted British names that for her seemed incongruous. She was expecting to see Indigenous Australian place names and instead she encountered a landscape replete with place names that, to her, were signs of Britishness and not Australianness. So, in the process of settlement, if Aboriginal place names were ignored or, or not sought, settlers were obliged to articulate or make sense of the land. And looking at the pioneer squatter William Learmonth for example, when he was exploring the country west of Ballarat, he noted that being in great distress from the highest point, of, being in great distress from want of water, water, we passed a most uncomfortable night under the highest point of the mountain ranges that, that he was in, which we called Mount Misery. And you can see. A foolish name, which it has unfortunately continued to bear ever since. So that's Learmonth's writing in 1853. Yet Mount Misery had a perfectly fine Wadawarung place name, Langi Yin, meaning Camp of the Moon. Now to look at the... Um, oh, there's Learmonth there. 
No, it's Tom Austin, um, well known for introducing rabbits into Victoria, which is going to stay with him forever, that reputation. So the Austin family took land near Geelong and they're reputed to have had this exchange. I'm going to make a township of that paddock running down to the river. What name shall I give it? Mrs Austin at once said, call it Chilwell, after my old home. So what the Austins were doing, they were bringing into being a place by announcing their intention to do so. Chilwell was a point of reference, a place that had been linguistically settled for them. There was no, no more ambiguity about what that place was going to be called. So these are examples of thousands of transplanted place names imposed on Aboriginal toponyms in Victoria. Some settlers actively sought out Indigenous place names, however the vast majority did not. New settlers were active agents in the process of placemaking and place name conferring in the colonial situations they found themselves. So they were challenged by an exotic cultural and natural landscape with which they had no place attachment. Now some, um, I'm disappointed to say, believe that the new landscape was completely devoid of any Indigenous cultural impress. George Hamilton, for example, argued that pre-colonial Australia was a country without a geography populated by a race of men without a history. I mean, preposterous. Many settlers sought the easy option of transplanting British place names with which they had already had attachment. Many did not care that in conferring colonial place names, they were dispossessing local Indigenous names. In fact, many were actively and deliberately creating this new cultural landscape. So what this means is that place names with a strong attachment um, were being given to places with a weak but emerging attachment. However, there were some settlers, and James Dawson from Camperdown is a classic example, who were passionate about learning Aboriginal place names. And writing in 1881, he noted, it is deeply to be regretted that the opportunity for securing the native names of places has in many districts gone forever. In those parts where a few old men are still to be met with, the white inhabitants, generally speaking, take no interest in the matter. With a very few worthy exceptions, they have done nothing to ascertain and record even those names which appertain to their own properties. How much more interesting would have been the map of the colony of Victoria had this been attended to at an earlier period of its history? So what I'd like to do now is, is launch into an examination of some of the place names in the district. So we'll start the ramble. And what a great old geographic term. We should, we should reintroduce it into our everyday vocabulary because to ramble along the landscape, within the landscape, is a wonderful thing. So some Indigenous place names are descriptive. Many are parts of important ancestral stories and often relate to the actions of ancestral heroes or they may refer to body parts. Um, now, just down near Camperdown, there's a particular body of water that the... I um, can't remember the actual name, but I can remember what it means. And it means... Um, well, translates into dog urine. And um, it means that you can't drink it. It tastes like dogs. Yeah. yeah. That's a very descriptive place name. And um, the Indigenous name for Mount Stapleton in, in Gurriwood Grampians is Gunigelk. Now, a Gunigelk is a spatula or, or a very small digging stick used to bury your excreta or your excrement. 
So it's a very important thing, very, very important. But it was one of the very few names that the local tourism authority refused to accept in the renaming proposal in the early 90s. They said, we cannot have Mount Stapleton being called excrement stick. <laughs> and, and yet, as I tried to make the case at the time, that was a very important window into traditional ways of life, into traditional practices, because the people were very carefully burying their, their excreta to make sure their traditional enemies weren't able to practice bad medicine against them. So it was a, it was a very telling uh, lesson into traditional life ways. But no, the tourism authority says, no, we cannot have Mount Stableton being called excrement stick. So it never stuck. It never got up. And the other one that never got up, which, which really disappoints me as well, the traditional name for Mackenzie's Falls is Makunang Wirap, which means where the blackfish, the Wirap, which you'll also see in Kurirap, can go no higher because they can't go any higher because they've reached the bottom of the falls. The local tourism authorities refused to accept Makunang Wirap, so it never got up. Mackenzie's Falls stayed, which I, I found a real shame, particularly when dual naming was the clear resolution to all the dilemma, but they weren't prepared to even accept dual naming, which was a real shame. So um, let's um, look at Laldale Falls. Now, there have been several names recorded for Lal Lal Falls, including Lal Lal. Um, the other one is Bunjil. Now, I've, I've made a case in my research into the history of naming of Lal Lal Falls that Lal Lal is a generic word for waterfall in Wadawarang language and that the specific name is Bunjil. So... Um, uh, William Withers, the early historian of Ballarat, um, in his early history of Ballarat, gives an explanation as to how the name Lal Lal came around, about. So um, Pettit, who took up the Dowling Forest Run, was living at the Little River and he had with him uh, a native clan head or chief, Baliang. So the place named Baliang um, is named after that that man. And he offered to show um, Pettit around uh, the, the, the area around here. And then when they came to um, the, the falls, he described it as Lal Lal, which he indicated meant falling water. But when um, George Augustus Robinson uh, visited um, the falls in March 1840. Uh, he was told that it, it was named, the falls were, had two names, Bunjil and Warring Ganinyok. And Nandan was the name of the little fall. Now we know uh, from all the records that uh, Lalau Falls was one of three living sites of Bunjil, the creator. So you actually can't find a more sacred place in Victoria than Lalau Falls. It's one of the most important sites uh, for Indigenous peoples, particularly in this part of Victoria. And not that far from Lalau Falls, you have um, Karit Barit at Black Hill near Gordon, where Bunjil created humans. So that landscape connecting Black Hill, Karit Barit at Gordon and Lal Lal Falls, Bunjil, you can't find a more significant landscape than, than that interconnecting country. So that would confirm, in, in my understanding, that Lal Lal is a generic word for waterfall and that Bunjil, or Warringan Yannick, uh, is the um, particular specific name for, for the falls. And you find the, the name Bunjil um, 
is still exists nearby in the uh, pastoral run named Bungal, B-U-N-J-L, which is a very poor way of saying Bunjil. And there are other, other um, there's another waterfall also named after Bunjil, the Wannan Falls near Hamilton, was known as Bung Bunjil, and the local clan was Bung Bunjil Gundich. And the other, the other living site of Bunjil was Mount Shank, down at the peninsula. Not sure whether you can see it, but there's a, just so you can the detail, there's a person standing there. Now, um, some place names aren't really place names. And I, I, I put to you that Wendaree is an example of a place name that actually isn't a place name. When you look at the, um, what, what, what they are is an example of misunderstanding between the speaker and the person recording. So, uh, Yule asked a, a woman who was uh, at the edge of the swamp um, uh, gathering some things. Um, he supposedly asked her, what is your name for this place? And she said, Wenduri, 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 which means go away, off you go, be off. So not a place name at all. And in some of the um, recorded place names that have come down in some of our uh, primary documents, when, when linguists have analysed the names, they've been transcribed to mean things like, I don't know, um, or um, they've pointed to a mountain and they've said, what, what is that? What is your name for that? And they've said, finger. <laughs> you know, what is that? Because they've seen the finger. Or what are they and what's your name for that? And they've simply said, Gawa, which means mountains, or, or that mountain over there. So they actually haven't given the, the authentic name, they've just given a general response. Um, another classic example is Lake Bolak. Bolak, or Bullock, simply means lake. So it's not, it's a generic descriptor. That body of water is a lake, it's a Bullock, which you'll find Bullock everywhere. Um, it's not the real name, it's not the authentic indigenous name for, for that body of water. And it's really I ironic that when you translate that word, it means lake, lake. I mean, that's, that's not nonsense to call something lake, lake. So there are many examples like that. But I, I think the classic one is, um, you know, what is your place meaning for that? And then said, I don't know and the person has recorded it assiduously. <laughs> yeah. So what are we going to do with this place name and this, um, this um, suburb name, which means go away, be off, you know, pee off, <laughs> to use a stronger word. It's not a... It's an exhortation to get away, get out of here, leave me alone. <laughs> Not a place name at all. It's become one, but it, it probably shouldn't be. So maybe we do need to get rid of the Wendery State Electorate. <laughs> and it becomes Eureka. Although, you know, do we want to have a Greek, is it a Greek word or Latin word, Eureka? I don't know. It's a Greek word, yes. Do we want a Greek word? I don't know. That's a debate for us to have later. Okay, so let's, let's romp through uh, some of some local names. How are we going for time, Anthony? Okay. Okay. So, um, Bald Hill, very original descriptive name. They were very imaginative that day, weren't they? Yes. What shall we call this hill? We'll call it Bald Hill because <laughs> it has no forest on it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know what its indigenous name means, but its indigenous name has been recorded as Gunapan. Um, possible Guni Guna 
is the ubiquitous word for excrement. Um, so in gunigalk, the first part of the word gunigalk is guna or guni, which is excrement, so I don't know, maybe. Um, Ballarat, resting place, reclining on elbow, uh, resting on elbow. Uh, maybe background information um, regarding an ancestor who, who reclined on their elbow at this site. And um, the first part is, is the word for elbow, which uh, is baluth, and you see that also in ballerine. Of course, the Wadawurrung language goes from here all the way down to Geelong and the Ballerine Peninsula, so it makes sense that you would find um, other place names having that word baluf in it. So I suppose some could say that, you know, does this mean that Ballarat is a great place for, for um, seniors to retire to? It's a great resting place. Maybe that's an argument that we should get our, our, um, our marketing team to, to work, do some work on. I don't know. Another very descriptive name, which is the music to the ears of anyone that's developing a wind turbine, Mount Blowhard. <laughs> um, and it's not ironic that the... It's not surprising that the Indigenous word means wild. Mortillo. Uh, Mount Bolton, um, its indigenous name was Boriga, which means loose ground. And Robinson explained that the uh, Boriga referred to the bluff at the north end and that the west end elevation was called Garpi Bengo. So that's an example of what we call a microtoponym. So the one feature has... has uh, micro names within it. So um, whether that means that you change the name of the of the single feature to have two names, um, that's 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 another possibility. Mount Bunyong um, has the word bun in bun, which is knee, um, and. Um, Possibly Yoang, which is the word for mountain, but it may also mean with his or her knees. So it literally means um, sort of lying on the ground, holding your knees together. So um, it, it could refer to an ancestor lying down with their knees raised. So lying on your back with your knees raised. Um, Burrumbeet is a very common place name. Um, um, Burrumbeep near Ararat and Purrumbeet near Camperdown, they're all the same word, they're all the same place name. Simply means muddy water. So it's a descriptive place name. And Burrumbeet Creek, um, the primary sources tell us that it, it's possibly dry wool, which could mean stony, or it could be dari wool, meaning turkey. Mount Calendar was once known as Black Hill. It has the name Kolonyok Gallon and we don't know what that means. Although yuck is the word for eel, so I don't know whether that could be right or not. And unfortunately Mount Cavern, uh, Bungarit Court, we don't know the meaning of that either. Now, not being born and bred in Ballarat, I'm not sure how to pronounce this one. Is it Kogels or Coghills? Kogel. Yep. Kogels Hill, um, named after David Kogel, who squatted in the district from 1838. Uh, this, this indigenous place name is Kurat Gurk, which has the, the suffix Gurk, which means red, blood or female. So... Presumably, it, it means it's a, a woman's a woman's site. Presumably, uh, Combajuk, which is the name of a pastoral station, uh, we don't know the meaning of that. Sadly, Gong Gong, uh, we think is a corruption of Gang Gang, which is the um, Wiradjuri 
word from New South Wales for gang gang cockatoo. And Mount Hollowback, Langi Guragurk, which means home of female kangaroos. Now, Langi, that's that very common um, first element you see in many place names across central Victoria. Langi Kalkel, Langi Duran, Langi Barramal, uh, Langi Willie, Langi Logan, and Langi means the home of or the nest of, the camp of. So it's a very common start of any place name. And here's the word gurk, which means female, and gura, which is kangaroo. Now, Lake Learmonth. Named after the Learmonth brothers, of course. Tombine or Timboon, freshwater mussel. And you'll also find that in Timboon down near Camperdown and Timboon down near Allens Allensford. Freshwater mussel. Miner's Rest, um, as we know, a place of rest for diggers on their, on their way to the goldfields. Uh, Drawul, uh, which is probably the same word as Trawalla, which means either wild water, much rain, or may refer to Drawul, the bush turkey, or stony. So I don't, I don't know, uh, I've never lived in Miner's Rest. Is it a very wet place? Does it, get, it, does it get a lot of rain? Does it flood a lot? Yeah, so there you go. It's, yeah, so therefore it's probably probably um, an appropriate name, wild water or much rain. Um, Mount Pisgah, is that how you pronounce that? I've never... Is it, is it Mount Pisgah? Yeah. This is a hill near Warborough, named after a hill from which Moses viewed the promised land, meaning fragmented rock. Now, its indigenous name was Marambul... Bull, bulled, and we know that bulled means two, but we're not sure what the rest of the word means. Uh, we do know that Sago Hill, uh, the indigenous name is Kula Gate Yellock, and that means Lava Creek. So, um, Kula is the traditional name for Mount Rouse down near Penshurst. Kula. So, Kula is the ubiquitous word for. for for lava, and yellow is the ubiquitous word for creek. Mordialic, Pyrenealic, you'll see that, that name, um, or even yellow itself as a single name, you'll see that quite common across central Victoria. So that, that means lava creek. Now I always love the fact that we have a Russian place, a Crimean place name. <laughs> Uh, in, in Ballarat, Sevastopol, or Sevastopol, but I believe its Russian pronunciation is Sevastopol. And um, when I said earlier that place names are windows into the landscape or clues into the past, the layering down of Crimean place names like Redan and Sevastopol gives a clear clue to you that those names were probably layered during the Crimean War or just after. And in fact, we know they were. So their place names can tell you a lot about past cultural history, a lot about our past. So comrades, um, Sevastopol, uh, the indigenous name for Sevastopol is Ron Ron or Ran Ran. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know what that means. Mount Warren Um we think Warren is tree root, but according to Withers it mean, meant emu feathers from the appearance presented by the ferns and other forest growth there. Uh, Warbra, we believe, is the indigenous name for McCallum Creek, and according to one source it means lose the way and references the crooked, uncertain course of McCallum Creek uh, Yarrawee. Well, it's possible. Yeah. It's very possible, yeah. 
Um, the, the source is 1918, so by that stage could well have... In, uh, it, uh, yeah. Uh, Yarrawee, um, some bright spark thought that it meant the small Yarra, as in the wee Yarra, um, but um, we know that it was recorded by Surveyor Darcy in, in 1837 and we believe it's a contraction of Yarram Yalluk, which means waterhole river. So it has a lot of waterholes. But other names include Nari Willem and Waywat Gadjan, and Gadjan is a common word for water. Now, we're, we're, we've only, we're close to the end. We've, I just want to finish by looking at Balan. So um, there are numerous place names where we can't be clear whether the place name is indigenous or whether it's transplanted. And it's quite possible that the, um, the, the local European heard an indigenous name but also heard a similarity to their homeland and were quite comfortable to to use the local name but confer on that local name the meaning of what it meant for them back home as well. And I, I'm suggesting to you that Balan could be an example of this. And this is called um, polesimi, which means many meanings. So the place name may not just have one source. It could have many sources. So all the dictionaries of Victorian place names are in agreement that Balan is a transplanted toponym or place name from Northern Ireland. Now, my, my mother's family is from Northern Ireland, so I dare not upset them uh, from um, Porter Ferry. So whenever I hear Van Morrison, I hear my forebear's accent. That's my connection to my Irish roots, listening to Van Morrison. So anyone with a surname Tawny is connected to me through my mother. It's a little name dropper there. Yeah. So Kate, Kate, who's, you know, done well for herself down at the State Library of Victoria, cousin Kate. So um, Saxton, for example, in 1907, wrote that Balan was named by Robert von Stiglitz, after a property in the north of Ireland where he was born. The Balan Times accepted this interpretation, uh, as did the Balan Historical Society in 1989. Thomas O'Callaghan, uh, 1918, was more expansive. The village of Balan was surveyed in 1850 by Assistant Surveyor Malcolm. Mr Hoddle, in forwarding the plan, wrote that his honour, the superintendent, had named the village Balan. Or as I remember once I heard Eddie McGuire say Ballon. I distinctly remember Eddie first saying Ballon and he said Ballon. I thought, no way, Eddie. You're clearly not a local, Eddie. <laughs> You're not a local. And we know that Ballon, or Ballon, was the name of a pastoral station close to the village and then owned by Robert von Stiglitz and he had named it after an estate in Ireland. So that's O'Callaghan. And he identified his information source as the chief draftsman of the Lands Department and Saxton's 1907 publication. Later dictionaries such as Martin in 1944 and Les Blake in 1977 uh, derived their information derived from Saxton and O'Callaghan and they don't add any further information Masola, in his 1968 Aboriginal Dictionary, does not suggest that Balan is an Aboriginal place name. I'm, I'm the first to uh, consider the possibility that it may have an Aboriginal origin in, in uh, the dictionary that I produced in 2002. And it revolves around Balan being a contraction of Balanjap. So, Robert William von Stiglitz occupied a run he named Balan or Ballon, um, on the right bank of the Werribee River at Balan in April 1838 
and his brother, John Lewis von Stiglitz, occupied an adjoining run and look at its place name. Its name was Balanese. Now, Emma von Stiglitz, nee Cowie, the wife of John, provided us with many, has provided us with a pictorial record of early Balan. And unfortunately, I couldn't find online um, a copy of her sketch, First Settlement at Balindyap. So there she is, there she's recording um, this name for the, the place, Balindyap. And there's a second sketch um, with that spelling. So I'm suggesting that um, Balan is likely to be uh, a contraction of Balanjap. But because Balanjap sounded so much like Balan, his home, home place, he was comfortable to adapt the name Balanjap and reduce it to Balan. So um, this is what we call an example of polysemy. Uh, or then, then again, its similarity may purely be coincidental. But it, it could be an example of what uh, Kostansky has understood as Anglo-Indigenous place name production, where in the primary aim of adopting an Indigenous name for colonial landscape identification reflected an imperialist vision, overlooking or little concerned with the true meaning or significance of the name. So they felt comfortable to change Balanyap into Balan. So um, I think I'll, I've been rambling long enough. 